Hello and welcome to my channel. If you are new, if you are a returning subscriber, welcome back and thanks for watching another video. In this video, I wanted to share with you a look through slash review of what has quickly become my favorite language arts curriculum. Um, it is called Logic of English and it's their foundation series. And this particular look through and review is going to be covering books A and B, which we have already completed in our homeschool in this 2018-2019 school year. We have just started book C. And so after I complete book C and possibly D, if I combine those, I will do another look through and review of those books because they are different than what books A and B are. A and B are kind of just an extension of each other and so it's one that I feel like I can do a good look through and review of together but I'm not sure yet on books um, C and D so I'll just have to wait and see how those ones go. Um, but I wanted to show you this because I don't know if you're like me but I have tried a number of language arts programs throughout our homeschooling years. This is our um, like our officially I think our fourth homeschool year. Um, let me count. Third, second, first, fourth, fifth. It just depends on when you officially count it with my youngest doing preschool at home. Um, I did do like a formal preschool with her. Um, but you know, it's so it's our fourth or fifth year, but I have been trying out different language arts program and none of them, none of them have worked like this program has. And so I have a third grade nine-year-old daughter, a first grade seven-year-old daughter, and a transitional kindergarten um, five-year-old daughter, and they are all using the program with me. My oldest daughter has had a real struggle with learning to read. She does, we finally unofficially officially diagnosed her with dyslexia, so she does have that challenge. She also has division develop, division vision development delays, um, which we are currently doing vision therapy for. Um, so she ha does have these other underlying issues with helping her to learn to read. And we, I have tried Explode the Code, Hooked on Phonics, um, Sing Spell Read Write, which I do have a review on my channel of that. And it is a good program. It's just not it doesn't hold a candle to this program, I'll just say that, as well as All About Reading, um, which All About Reading, I would say, is similar in a lot of ways to Logic of English, but that curriculum just never clicked with us. It was a really, really big struggle to get through. Whereas this one, while it does not, well, I can't say it doesn't have challenges and it's not still um, a good effort on both my kids' part and my part as well to teach it, um, the, the struggle just is not there like it was with All About Reading. Um, so I've tried all of those programs and like I said, I have not seen results like I've seen with this program with any of the other ones. So I am like so, so, so thankful that I got introduced to this curriculum and am able to use it. I will tell you, and this is not a sponsored video by Logic of English, um, but we are part of a public charter school. That's who we homeschool through. And they did provide the curriculum for us. They paid for it. However, if I had discovered this program on my own and we weren't with a charter school, I would have bit the bullet and paid for it out of pocket because it is rather expensive. But the results I'm seeing through it, and this is only having gone through two of the four books for their foundations program, it's just like it's leaps and bounds ahead of everything else that I've tried. And I've just seen so much improvement in all of my girls, but especially my oldest. And so it's I, I can't ever go back to anything else. And I just wanted to let you know in case you were looking for a good, complete, all-encompassing language arts curriculum um, and you were financially able to afford it, let me tell you, your money would be well spent on this program. Okay, so I don't think there is anything else I wanted to say in the introduction to this video. So let me flip the camera around. I want to show you books A and B, go through it. But I also will probably be telling you as I go through it, kind of how we used it in our homeschool. Because um, while we followed it, probably 90 to 95% of how it was supposed to be taught through the book, um, there were some things that I kind of adjusted for our needs at the time, whether we were struggling 
um, just with time and not having the time to devote as much to this or just adapting it to my three different age girls and their different you know levels of being able to go through the program so and it is a program that's supposed to be able to be taught in a classroom setting or one-on-one -on -one. and they give you instructions and you'll see that in the book for being able to do both if you hear kids in the background they're all home because remember homeschool mom here so just just so you know that you may hear them um <coughs> I'm also getting over a cold, so I apologize if my voice sounds off or, or weird or if I start coughing, um, just know that that's why, but I really wanted to get this video to you before I have to return any of the materials to our charter school um, at the end of the year, and I just knew I needed to do it now so I wouldn't forget about it later, and especially because book B is more fresh in my mind, I want to make sure to go through it now instead of waiting until after I've gone through book C, and then I'm like, oh, wait. This is all different. It wouldn't be that different, but you know, you know what I mean. Okay, so let me turn the camera around and show you all the materials that you get with this curriculum. Before I go into anything else, I want to talk about the fact that they have both the workbooks, the student workbook, student workbooks in cursive as well as in manuscript, and you can choose which one you want your child to use. I opted for cursive. One, because I wanted my kids to learn how to write in cursive and be able to read it as well. And secondly, it's supposed to help children with dyslexia um, be able to remember how to form letters easier because everything's being done with fluid strokes. You're not lifting up your pencil, so there's less room for error. That is the, the goal of it. Um, and while I see that is valid for handwriting. It is not, at least in my experience, as valid for actually reading because everything that kids read, unless it's an old historical document, or maybe there's like a letter in a book that, you know, is supposed to be handwritten and they wrote it in cursive. So except for those few instances, they are going to be reading in manuscript and print writing. And so when a child with dyslexia sees a B or a D and they flip it, all of the cursive handwriting practice in the world is not necessarily going to help them to not flip that letter because it's not in cursive and they are not physically writing it. I don't know if that totally makes sense or not. But I have found that to be true after going through, at least with my daughter, after going through this cursive writing book. Now, I do not regret getting the cursive one because my oldest had already learned how to write cursive through um, Handwriting Without Tears, and she has beautiful penmanship. She knows how to write in cursive really well, and I wanted my other two daughters to learn. My youngest daughter, my five-year-old, writes better in cursive than she does in print. Um, so she, her default in a lot of ways is going to cursive because I never formally taught her how to do printing. Um, so in some ways, I'm really glad for that. But again, it doesn't necessarily, at least in my experience, correlate over into the reading part of everything. So I just wanted to point that out. Another thing I forgot to mention, um, and I have another thing to say about this too, so let me go for this other thought. This curriculum follows the Orton-Gillingham um, method of teaching phonograms and phonics and how to read, um, which is in line with the best methods. That's one of the best methods to use for teaching children with dyslexia. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that, that this curriculum does fall in line with that. So if you are looking specifically for a curriculum to teach a dyslexic child, this is wonderful for that, but your child does not need to have dyslexia or any other learning um, disability or challenges to do really, really well in this program. It's I can't imagine teaching anything else, like I've said to my kids. Um, it just makes so much sense. Okay, back to this, the cursive. Um, so they teach it in books A and B, how to form all of your letters. And um, and I've heard, but I'm not, I, I don't know for sure yet because we haven't gone through book C, that they, some of that um, practice in cursive 
is taken out. And so you don't get an option of a cursive or a manuscript workbook in books C and D. Everything's in manuscript. So when I heard that, I was like, oh, shoot, I want my kids to get more practice in this. I don't want them to lose their skills just because they're not using it. Now, I don't know that that's totally true because I feel like when I just quickly went through book C, the very beginning, it sounds like they are going to have passages or things to write out and they need to copy it from manuscript into cursive. So it sounds like they may still be getting that practice, but at the time I didn't know that. So I went ahead and purchased through the school again. Um, this is from Logic of English, The Rhythm of Handwriting. So if you were just looking for a handwriting program for your kids, they have books to teach just that. It goes through how to do letter formation and letter strokes exactly like they teach it in the foundations book, but it's all about handwriting, nothing else. Um, excuse me. So I may not have needed this, but at the same time, I think it's going to be good practice for my kids. I also found online, and I will put a link to it below, um, a place where you can actually buy their font. So you can buy their font, install it on your computer, and you can make up your own copy work for your kids to copy um, with whatever you want them to write. So whether it's scripture passages or passages from a book you're reading or any old thing, things that they come up with and you want to write it, you can write it in their, um, in their font after purchasing it and they can practice handwriting that way as well. So I have gone ahead and done that as well. I just haven't used it yet, but that's another way to maybe not purchase these, these books because it is, again, just repeating this. I'm, I think it's going to be good for my kids, though. Uh, again, just added practice. But if you didn't want to do this, you can purchase the font and do it yourself without having to this book. Okay, so I also though bought one. I bought so I bought three of these for my three girls, but I did buy one of the manuscript because, like I said, my youngest daughter, she is better at cursive than she is at manuscript because I've never formally taught her manuscript. Um, so I know she does not form her letters correctly not all of her letters, I should say, correctly. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna go through this book with her individually so that she knows how to do manuscript writing, um, handwriting, and doesn't fall behind in, in that regard. Um, so this is just for my one daughter. So I just wanted to point that out to you just to let you know that you have the option for books A and B, whether you want cursive or manuscript. Okay, now let me get everything else over here so I can show you the rest of the curriculum. I was really struggling with what order to show you all of this to you, and um, I wasn't sure if I should start with the teacher's manual and the student workbook or show you all this extra stuff, and it's not even all in my screen right here. I'm going to pull it forward so you can see it all. Um, and I think I'm going to start here because we're going to reference all of this in the teacher's manual. So I thought it might be better for you to have an idea of what I'm talking about when I reference it in the manual. So hopefully this is a good order to show it to you in. So with uh, the, I don't know, the package that you get with the curriculum, you're going to get a bunch of different types of flashcards. So these ones, and I believe you could order these also if you're just looking for the handwriting program. So it's their tactile cards. So we originally just got the cursive ones, again, because we were using the cur cursive workbook. Um, but I just recently got the manuscript ones, so I can, again, teach those to my youngest daughter. And these are like sandpaper cards. So you, um, if you trace it with your finger, you feel it's like slightly raised and bumpy like sandpaper. So when you are teaching your children how to write, how to form these letters, you do a variety of things. It's a um, multi-sensory type teaching program. So you may start with writing it really big with your whole arm in the air. And then, and you're verbally telling them like which type of stroke you're going to use to form each, each of these things. They also have a name for this is your top line, your midline, your bottom line. So you're saying you're going to start your stroke at the top line or at the bottom line. Um, and let me show you. Okay, so here's a lowercase. And they have names. So this is like a swing stroke and you're going to swing up to your midline, loop down to the bottom line. So you, you give them verbal cues. And after you do that and you do that in the air a few times, then you're going to hand out these tactile cards so that they can trace it with their own finger multiple times. And on the back of each one, they tell you 
exactly okay so I even had it wrong <laughs> so they say small loop up to the midline down to the baseline um it's been a while since I've taught these so we don't use the verbal cues as much anymore so please forgive me for any errors I have in this I'm going to do my best to tell you the best information I can um so they give you the verbal cues so you can hold this up to your child you know they're on that side you're on this side and tell them um what exactly you're supposed to say so they don't leave you in the lurch here okay um they also give you the sounds that it makes and then examples of which sound can be used in different words um so they give you everything um so you're not you're not you're never left hanging i'll tell you that um so these are used when you're learning how to form letters and again i haven't used these yet but i'm assuming the manuscript are going to be very similar Yes, so it's going to be very, very similar, and they're giving you the names of the strokes and what exactly to say in an example. So those are your tactile cards for learning how to actually write. Then you have these basic phonogram, fa sorry, I'm sorry, guys, I'm sick here still. Basic phonogram flash cards. You also have, and this is a second set that we just got, and I'll tell you why I got a second set in a minute advanced phonogram flashcards, which we have not gotten into yet. I only have a single set of this. So these are our basic ones. And it like the handwriting ones, you flip it over, it's going to tell you the sounds that it makes and give you examples of words because there are times when I'm like, Oh, how would you make that sound? Oh, and this is a good example for it right here are the you this is one of my trouble ones. So the last sound on here, how you say that and I'm like I could not get it for the life of me but it, it helps me when I in my head I say put uh uh so I think of it so that I can you know say it to my kids and help them with it because otherwise it trips me up um so and then they also sometimes will give you other little information down here um they even give you information I believe if on certain ones oh I think it's like uh with the letter qua you know q u let me see if I can find it real fast, not take forever. They give you an example that it's used in England, in British English, I want to say, or it's Canadian. I found it. <laughs> okay, I was right. It was actually British and Canadian. So on the back, it says qua, and then you see it's not quite as bold, the k. So it says q is always written with a u next to it. Canadian and British students should also add the sound ka as in check. For American students, this is an advanced sound as in critique. So they give you examples and they give you more information. So my kids learn this as kwa ka. So whenever they see this, they're supposed to think automatically kwa ka, not just kwa. So um, we went ahead and learned that now, and that's obviously up to you and depending on where you live. I also wanted to point out this one because it gives you a little hint on the back. Now it only has a single sound, but it says two letter k used only after a single short vowel. So this actually is telling you a spelling rule that they have with this one, which we actually have not, I don't think we've learned this one. So when you're teaching your children um, the spelling portions, they have rules to go along with them. And then they also have them on the back of these phonogram cards so that you can remember them um, here as well. One thing I should have mentioned with the handwriting portion is they do have these little like desk, um, what are these called? Desk, I don't even know. They go on your desk, you know, so you, a reference thing on your desk for both the cursive and the manuscript. Um, we just got these recently from the school when I got all that manuscript stuff and those handwriting books. So we actually have not been using these consistently, but my kids are using them in their workbooks as kind of a bookmark. And then they also have them as reference for when they do need to remember how to um, write a letter, we can find it on here and then they can remember um, how it's supposed to look at least. I also forgot to mention that with these tactile cards, we only have one set. If you're teaching multiple children this, it could be beneficial to have a second set my youngest daughter was truly the only one that consistently used them in learning to write the letters. My oldest, like I said, she had already learned handwriting, cursive handwriting, so she really didn't need them. My middle daughter, uh, 40 to 50% of the time she would use them, but it was my youngest that used them the most. So 
I guess depending on how much of a tactile learner your children are, maybe that would determine whether you need more than one set, but one set did our family fine for the three girls. One set of the phonogram cards did great for us until we went on a trip and I just posted these videos. Um, we went to Seattle, my husband and myself, and my parents took the two older girls and my in-laws took the two younger kids. And so my girls were split and they were being taught school at each respective house by either my mom or mother-in-law. And they were doing this program there. And I was able to make photocopies of the pages I needed to of like the instructor's manual and different things. But I had to make like individual flashcards um, for for one group. Um, so I had to go through and write all the flashcards and then I had to write the sounds on the back and everything. So I had wished that I had had a second set for that reason alone. Otherwise, if we were never splitting up the kids to teach them, I would not have needed a second set of them. So just think through what your family needs are. If there is ever going to be an oper a chance that your kids might, if you're teaching more than one child at the same time and they might not be all together all the time, you might want to have more than one of these types of things. Okay, your other set of flashcards are these spelling rule flashcards. Now, we do not get these out necessarily too much, um, except for, for me, sometimes I've gone through and go and just to double check what a rule is that they have taught us instead of going back through the teacher's manual and trying to find it i can quickly go through here and go oh yeah that one sounds familiar familiar we must have learned that one and this is the rule um so we know how to spell you know different things um so i do think these are useful i they are a good reference guide for me at least um so again one set of these should be sufficient to go along with all of that they have this like almost like a bookmark. Um, they call it their spelling analysis quick reference. And so it tells you the order of how you're supposed to do things when you go through spelling in the in the workbook, um, or I should say the teacher's manual, and you have spelling almost every lesson. Um, they have a very specific order that they want you to introduce each word. Um, so you say the word, you say the word in a sentence, and they give you all this, you'll, you'll see it in a little bit, and then they you say the word again and then the students help you segment the words and figure out the sounds so they have a very specific order in how you go you approach your spelling words every single lesson and then on the back here this one is for um, multiple syllable words so this one was for single syllable and then multiple syllable and this is just like a like it says a quick reference guide they also have a much bigger reference guide so it gives you all the rules laid out it opens up like this and I will tell you I don't know that I have ever um, really looked at this I don't know if I ever will so far I haven't needed to um, but it's here I know it's here in case I need more help so it's kind of nice knowing that I have it but I I have not needed to reference this I have referenced this a few times but they also at least so far in books a and B give you a lot of clues um anyways in the manual so i haven't needed to pull that back to handwriting i know i'm kind of all over the place and i apologize for that um they also have this quick reference guide for handwriting so it, it tells you information on the letters how to form them again this is something that i have not really used but i wanted to show it to you that this does i believe come with the complete package um if I don't know that I would necessarily have purchased this on my own. I may have purchased the phonogram and spelling rule one on my own if it didn't come with the package. Next over here, we have these phonogram game cards. And there's three of them. So you have your red manuscript, your green cursive, and your blue book face. Um, this, again, we just got because I just got all the manuscript. Then, so we've had the green cursive and the blue book face, and I'll show you them. So it's it's just the phonograms on here, and there are a few pictures of things, and I wish I could tell you more about these, but we have not really used them. And one of the reasons we haven't really used them is because I only have one set 
until just recently, and I now have another blue book face set. And the book face is like what you would see in a book, like typed up, whereas the red manuscript is their manuscript um, writing. So let me show you so you can see the difference. And I don't know, I'm fairly certain they give you the um, blue book face and either the cursive or the manuscript with each set that you get. So I know it's kind of, I wish I had the same uh, same letter to show you so you could see it side by side. Well, there's another T, so you could at least see the differences in the T's to sh see what the difference are. Um, so these are supposed to be used during game times that are, you know, in, in the manual, and we have yet to really use any of them. Again, because you do actually need a set per child, and we just don't have that at least not of the same type. So we have two of these and each of those. So I mean, it's possible I could I could use one of each with the kids and in a way that would probably be good if, because there are times I believe when they say that you need at least two sets of the game cards. So at least you'd be able to separate them out easily so you know which stack they go in because they're different colors and different um, uh, fonts. Um, so I can't say much for those, but they are used in the book, in the manual, if you follow it to a T. Then the other thing we have over here are these, um, phonogram game tiles, which I just have in a bag for each of the kids. They come on sheets that you then have to rip apart. And then, so you see, we have a bunch ripped apart down here. These are also used throughout the book, and we have, I think, used them once so and I, I will get into that reasons why when I go through the manual and I come across these um, for in lessons but I just wanted to show it to you so you know what it is so there's game cards and there's game tiles there's also a whiteboard that you need for each child and it has oh I guess we didn't clean this off let's just clean that off real fast okay so you have the large side which is the side we use the most often and then you also have it smaller so you can write more on here so you you want one of these for each of your children it does not come with dry erase markers which you know most homeschool families have these around so just make sure you have them and then i just cut up a rag a terry cloth rag into four pieces and that's what we use for our eraser so it doesn't come with an eraser or dry erase marker just i'm sure you probably wouldn't expect it to but i just wanted to point it out in case and I think that does it for as far as the materials that you are going to use for across all the four books in the foundation series and materials you're going to be using. The other materials that you have are more specific to like book A or book B or book C. So I will show you those as I show you each teacher's manual and workbook. As I was cleaning up this stuff to get out the other stuff, um, I realized I should show you how I organize it in case it's something you wanted to know. So um, I just ha got this crate and I obviously haven't taken that off. Got this crate at Walmart and they're really cheap. And I've just put in the very back here these bags with the phonogram, phonogram game tiles on them. So they just sit back here. And then I, I've been putting in my extra flashcards that we aren't using right now so that plus these manuscript ones I'm just gonna I just set those back here I adjust these as needed so they fit okay and then um, since these are like duplicates are not being used right now they're going there then I have my advanced ones going here and then I put in our spelling rules so these just kind of hang out in the back and then I use that quick reference bookmark and I that's kind of how I separate it out. So this isn't gonna be flat, which is okay with where I store it on our bookshelf here. So I do that, and then I believe, I'm trying to remember exactly how I had it. These are my leftover um, cursive, uh, the strokes for the handwriting flashcards. So those just kind of went here. And then I put, this, this was just like a filler card, and I popped that one up, so that's another divider. Then I put 
the cursive ones that we've gone through, um, which we've gone through all of them. They're just here a bit. So what I would do is the ones we hadn't gone through yet would be behind this tab with all those stroke ones back here. And then the ones we have gone through so that I knew we've gone through them and I could pull them out easily because I knew we've already talked about them. Like if it was one we need a needed a refresher on, I knew that they were in front of this card and the ones behind were ones we hadn't gotten to yet. And then um, I just take this one and again, that becomes the bookmarker. So then, I have all the basic phonogram flash cards that we have not gotten to yet and these are in alphabetical order so I like to keep them in order. Um, again I use this as my bookmark I just flip it up that way and these actually I think if it, although I'm gonna change it because I'm gonna put it in front of the cursive ones since we're not really using the cursive ones anymore I think I used to put these so I had all the stuff we were using in the very front or had currently gone through and all the stuff we hadn't gotten to in the back but all in front of this spelling analysis card um, so I, I think this was behind like right there but because we're kind of done with learning cursive I'm gonna put it in front because that actually makes more sense right now so that's going to go there and then these are all the phonogram cards that we have already learned which we still do reference um often like in every lesson we'll almost be always pulling these out so i like to have those in the very front and i have it like this right now but i think honestly i may just keep that one down because it's easier for me to grab them if they're all poking up like that so that's my one, so it's just easy, easier for me to grab when I need to pull them out for a lesson. So that's how I organize all of these flashcards, and it has worked really, really well for me, keeping me organized, knowing where things are. Then as far as these game cards go, I had this little thing. I don't, I can't honestly, again, Walmart, can't remember if I bought it specifically for these or not. It worked when I only had two, because they fit, but now that I have four, I have to pop them up like this to get them all in there and then the lid doesn't doesn't fit so it just kind of hangs out like that and it works okay with how, where I have it on my shelf but um, it, it can't snap or anything but like I said it works for now maybe someday I'll um, get something that it fits in better but since we don't really use them I don't really want to spend the money on something else so I just wanted to show you how I organize those and now I'm going to bring you into book A. This is what you get for Foundations book A, the teacher's manual, the student workbook, and then this book called Doodling Dragons. And you will be told when you read out of Doodling Dragons, but it's a really fun book. And I'm just going to show it to you quickly so then I can set it aside. But it introduces your phonogram sounds. So it tells you, A says A, A, A. And then you read in the book how those different sounds are incorporated into words. So apples and ants, and they give you the symbols above so you know which way it's supposed to be, you know, pronounced. Snakes ate grapes, wash the walls, ah, a, ah. And you say this a couple times with your kids so that they can hear the difference um, in how this phonogram makes their sound. So it has every single phonogram in here with fun pictures and how how that phonogram is used in words and, and the sounds that it makes so it's we really enjoyed this book and um, there's another one like it for um, for book B and book C so we enjoy reading out of these and I'm trying to go back to the end here I think this one does cover all of the letters of the alphabet in this one and then in book B I believe it starts going into multi-letter phonograms and their sounds so book A is basically teaching you letters of the alphabet but through their sounds instead of their letter names I think next we'll start with the teacher's manual and I may go back and forth between the two I'm not really sure I'm gonna kind of wing this one because um, they go hand in hand but let's start with the manual first and then we'll get to the student workbook as needed. Okay, so they have like your traditional introduction type stuff. They have a scope and sequence, which this is all stuff. You can read good information, common core standards, how it meets those standards in what lessons it does. 
I just kind of skimmed over all of that, just so you know. Oh, if you are interested, their website has tons and tons and tons of information and videos on it that you can watch um, to get a better idea of how to teach this program. Okay, so here we are at lesson one. Um, they are going to tell you exactly what you're working on in this section. They also first, let me tell you, give you your objectives, what you're gonna be working on, and materials that you either need um, or are optional. And so at the beginning of each lesson, I tried as best as I could to get these things out. So I had them ready to go uh, and wasn't scrambling around, even trying to get them out of that crate that I just showed you. I would pull them out of there so I wasn't trying in the middle of it because that kind of like, um, you know, it, it interrupts the ebb and flow of your teaching. Then over here, they will tell you which items you will also need that they should have mentioned up here. So like mirror, Dr. Seuss book, mirror, Dr. Seuss book. So typically in these blue highlighted areas, they'll tell you the materials you need. This is an open and go curriculum, pretty much for the most part, other than getting some materials together. Uh, they tell you exactly what you're going to say and what the students should be saying for their responses. They have a lot of teacher tips over here and they're always in the screen box with this little bug insect thing. And then they have how it can be a multi-sensory fun tip. So they give you lots of information on the sides of the book. Oops, skip the page. They also tell you if there are um, books that would be good to, I'm sorry, that's out of the view. They also tell you if there are good books to be reading along with these. If you have the Bob books, those go hand in hand with this whole program. There's also um, other early readers that go well with it. I just don't remember the name of it, but the Bob books go really well because they do not introduce any words with sounds that you have not learned yet in the lessons. Let me see if I can zoom this in for you guys. Maybe that's better. Hopefully it's better and I'll just move the book along. All right, again, multi-sensory fun, teacher tip. So they tell you everything you need to know. Then you're coming down here for compound words. Then over on this side, um, let's see. Oh, getting into handwriting over here. And that's when you're gonna pull out the whiteboards, the tactile cards. And then it tells you exactly what you're supposed to say everywhere. It's, it really truly is open and go. Oops, again, skipping pages. Then they're introducing, like in here, they're introducing um, a stroke. Oh, up here, they have fun things like that you purposely do wrong so that your kids have to find the mistake and they buzz you on it or something. They try to make it really fun for the kids, you know, make it a fun learning experience. Um, so this first one is really basic, this lesson. Let me flip towards one of the later lessons to give you another idea. So I think I'm gonna do lesson 22 and 23, show you these two, because they have a few different things in them. So they're gonna, again, tell you exactly what you need with your objectives and your materials. Then they're telling you what you're working on next. So phonem phonemic awareness, then you're gonna focus on a specific phonogram. And this is when you're gonna get Doodling Dragon's book out. And you're gonna read out of it. And it tells you exactly what you're supposed to read, how many times you should read the pages for you. And then also if you should be having your children, your students participate. Um, and so sometimes they have them do like wave your arm or touch your nose or tap your head or jump up and down every time you hear a certain sound as I'm reading it out of that book. So they try to make it very involved for your kids. They're not just sitting there listening. They also have recommended like letter days and these give you ideas of different things you can do that start with that letter. We never did these, but if you had the time and the inc inclination to do it, go for it. Um, then down here again, handwriting. This book is used for both cursive and manuscript. You do not need a different teacher's manual to teach either of those student workbooks. They tell you if you are teaching cursive, you need to be aware of this or to teach this. If you're teaching manuscript, then you need to do this. So they give you information on both. So if it's in green, it's going to be cursive. If it's in the blue, it's going to be in manuscript. So just pay attention to which one you're teaching your kids. And then phonogram practice down there. And then there's typically 
games. Okay, so this is one of those things I wanted to talk about. So they typically have activities for the kids to get up and do things involving the phonograms and the flashcards or um, the game cards. Very often we would, I would opt to skip this because I just did not have the energy for it. We did do them a handful of times, I'll say that. But more often than not, I would take our stack of phonograms that we had learned and we'd kind of do like a popcorn type drill around the table and I would start with a different child each time and I would show them the phonogram and they had to tell me the sounds of the phonogram and then I would flip it and go to the next child. They would tell me those sounds and flip it and we would keep doing it until we got through our entire stack of phonograms. So oftentimes that is what I would do in place of doing one of these games. And that was just for my own sanity as well as time constraints that I felt like we had because we had a lot going on. So we did do these sometimes. We did do the physical activities because I knew that those are, I know they're good for kids, but we did not do them 100% of the time. I mean, I don't even know if we did them 90% of the time. So I just wanted to throw that out there and tell you what we actually did. All right, now on to the next lesson. Oh no, not on to the next lesson. We're still on this one. All right, so this, now they are breaking words apart for you so that you're teaching your kids how to listen for the sounds and how those sounds can get put together to make words. And then we get into spelling. So this is a very common way you're gonna see spelling set up. It's always in a chart like this. They have three words that they want you to go through for sure. And then two optional ones that are always in a colored highlighted boxes here. Um, we don't always get to them, but I try often to get to all five of them, um, just because I feel like the more practice, the better. So that is something that we try to do. If we're just really struggling that day, then I'll go, okay, three is sufficient. And so this is something that you can use either your whiteboard with and have them actually write it out, which is what we commonly did, or you could use those game tile pieces, which I think we used once. Um, so they give you the option of using either or. And then sometimes if it's like a newer or a harder word, they will tell you again how you should be going through that word, how you should be helping your kids sound it out, and um, which if it's a phonogram that has more than one sound to it, how you should mark that on the board as you're writing it on the board so that they know which sound they should be using. Another thing that I did not get out of here, but I got it from one of the teachers at our school, is when you are teaching a word that you actually say the word and show your kids how many how many phonograms um, you use to spell that word. So for pup, you would go p a p. So it would be pup, p a p. Now if it has a, um, let's say the word whole, which has a silent E, you would go h o u Oh, ooh. so you wouldn't say anything, but you would show them that it makes, it has four letters to spell it. So, and then if you have phonograms that are two letter phonograms, like boat, so b o t, b o t. And I'm used to doing it this way. I'm sorry, it's backwards. I should be doing b o t. To you so you can read it that way but when I'm doing it to my kids I'm holding my fingers like this so it's it's the right way for them <laughs> so I just realized that but that has helped a lot to help clue them in when it's a multi-letter phonogram or or the word high so you're using what they call a three-letter I so you're going I all right again sorry this way I so that clues them in they're supposed to be using the three-letter I when they spell high Okay, I hope that makes sense. But that really helped me once I learned that from our one of the teachers at our school to do that with them. And it helps, it just helps give them that visual clue that they sometimes need. Okay, then down here. So again, this is still part of the spelling. And then you get into the reading. And they have words in their workbook to read through. And then they also have stuff to act out. All right, so let's go over to lesson 23 here because I'm fairly certain it had a little bit different stuff in here. A lot of times it's very similar. Um, let's see. 
again, another phonogram game called Slap It, and they want you to have two sets of phonogram game cards. These are the phonograms they want you to use. Oh, and then two slap cards, which I think are in those game cards. Again, we didn't use them. I would use that popcorn popcorn phonogram flashcard thing. I don't know what you want to call it, but I would just have them go over the cards and, and yes, around the room. Um, let's see, again, we have words and spelling, reading. Maybe there wasn't anything different in this one. I guess not. For some reason, I thought there was something different. Okay, so it's a lot of the same in this book throughout the whole one because you are pretty much going through the alphabet, learning all the sounds and um, learning how to write the sounds, the phonograms. Did that make sense? You are learning all the letters of the alphabet, the sounds that, that they make, how to write them, and then how they're used in very simple words. I hope I'm making sense, guys. I'm sorry if I'm not. And then that's pretty much it for your book A. Let me show you now the student workbook that goes with this. So these workbooks are nice and colorful. The pages are perforated. Perf I'm not going to be able to say that. They can rip out easily, okay? So perforated. Is that? Gosh, this cold, it's getting me. All right, so they are very colorful. My kids like them. They give you multiple size lines for your child to practice writing their strokes on and their letters, and they tell them to find the size of lines that they like, that they are the most comfortable writing on, and to just use that line. So my this daughter who's like, she's way above as far as handwriting goes, for what we've been doing in these books. So she would do it on every line. But my other daughters would typically use one of these larger sets of lines and that's what the only thing they would write on. So they'd have you write the stroke or the letter, the phonogram, um, three times on your favorite size line. So it wasn't trying to fill up the whole thing, although you could if you wanted extra practice. Um, and so that's, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna zoom back a little bit just so you can see a little bit more. If you hear if you hear kids crying outside, <sighs> I know that sounds horrible, but don't worry, my husband is out there with them and there's other kids out there. He just sometimes has a hard time. So just in case you're hearing a bunch of noises, they're playing outside and that's just how he knows how to get attention right now. All right, so some of these they're working on kind of individually. This is something that would be done. Um, you're saying something out of your your manual and they're looking at these. Um, so it's it's done together. So there isn't always gonna be writing on every single page or you're, you're um, giving instructions of the manual and then they have to follow through with it um, in their workbook. I'm trying to show you more things. Okay, so it's, it's a lot of the same thing. Beginning sounds, middle sounds, and ending sounds they go over and they have to recognize though those. They do have other cards in here for games. Again, we didn't always use these, um, but we tried for some. So your child would rip out the page and then cut them out on the dotted line and use them in whatever game that was. In the very back throughout the um, book, so you don't wait till you get to the end of the book to start using these. You'll use them throughout the, the whole book are these pages with these really nicely colored pictures. And you would have, I'm trying to find the rest, unless we actually, I think we've torn them out. Okay, so what I'm trying to show you is you make these little readers. So this is my youngest daughter's. And you would tear out these pages and put them in, you know, staple them into a little book and they have words on the bottom. And then you get the pictures like these, You cut; they would cut them out. And then once they read the word, they would find the picture that matches it, cut it out and glue or tape it in. So they did that. So there were like, I wanna say at least six, I think, readers like this that they do this with. So your child could either use the pictures provided or like my oldest daughter who loves to draw, she typically drew, drew her own pictures and at the end she was just like eh she would just read me the book and be done with it but it was kind of neat because it's in a way an independent way for your child to read because you know if they got the picture right 
they had to have read the word to have actually matched up the picture well. Let me show you one of the later readers. Show you, it does get a little bit more complex, so it's not just single words anymore. And again, they give you all the pictures, so it, I like that myself because I am not an artistic person, so this would be right up my alley not having to come up with stuff on my own. So they would they would do that, but I would also have them read the book to me as well. So this is something fun, I thought, that this book, this book A did. And I think that is everything for book A. So let's move on to book B. Here are the materials that are specific to book B. So instead of those little paper readers that you created in book A, now they actually give you full on readers that your child is going to read with you. And they are colored. They are typically silly. They're not long. They're typically, at least from what I remember in book for this B set, um, or B level, I should say, they're about six pages long. They do, I want to make sure I'm telling you the right thing. They do get a little bit lengthier in how much your child is reading. So these were definitely more challenging for my youngest daughter and my middle daughter she'd get caught up on a few words, but she, she got through it fairly well. And my oldest was typically whizzing through them. But my youngest, my five-year-old, she, she did definitely struggle with things. But the great part about this program is that I could give her hints on things to help her decode the words to try to figure them out on things that we've learned. And so like for this play, the AY, that's a phonogram and it's it says a and it can only and it can be used at the end of English words as its spelling word um, rule I should say and then we also learned that y at the end says um, says the sound I sorry I'm having a hard time thinking right now and so I could give her little hoats oh my goodness I can give her little clues to help her or like that um, that's a silent E. So if that's a silent E, what does that say? Um, let's see here. Their one of their favorite phonograms is the double E. Their spelling rule is E double E always says E. And they love saying that. So they have some fun ones too. Um, let me think if there's anything else. Again, I'm having a hard time thinking here. Um, blue. Okay. That's a harder one in, in some regards. Because why do you need the E there? It's not the U is not saying it's long sound U. It's saying OO, which is a different sound it makes. But you have to have an E there because another spelling rule is English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. So because it has a U, it has to have an E because an English word cannot end in a U. There is the exception of the word Y-O-U, and we have come across that, but that is like the only exception, as well as the word I, like you and I are going to the park. Um, so there's like two two words we have come across that are like the only exception, but 99.8% like of the time, everything else follows that spelling rule of English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. But just having that in their heads is so helpful for them, not only to spell it, but also to sound it out. So those come with this set, this level. Then you get Whistling Whales, which is very similar to Doodling Dragons. Again, though, it's just with multi-letter phonograms now. So, and again, it tells you what it says, and then it tells you, it gives you fun pictures and sentences to do with it. So we like these. They're a lot of fun to go through. So that's that. We'll do the manual again first this time. Starts again with a scope and sequence. Materials needed. It also goes over the common core standards. All right, there. What lessons they're met in before you begin, hints and things like that. Um, all right, then we're starting with lesson 41. So it is a continuation. All of these books are actually continuations. So you don't start back at lesson one in each book. It just continues from the last one. And you'll see it is pretty much the same as book A, level A. It tells you exactly what you need to know 
it gives you the same topic there of what you're working on everything you need to say they are now introducing the abc song because i believe i did mention this they are teaching you letter sounds before letter names so now that your child knows letter sounds for all the letters of the alphabet now they can do the abc song however i'd find it i it would be hard for me to believe that kids starting this program don't already know the abc song just from being out and about and you know little educational games and shows that they do on apps and things like that so for them not to know it yet i would <laughs> find it a little odd just because of how much they're you know immersed in that as it is but maybe your child doesn't and that this is when it comes up okay um again we're still working on handwriting and this is when we start into upper cases so Level A was all lowercase, upper B is all uppercase. And combining, combining letters, if I'm not mistaken. Again, they differentiate, so you do not need separate books to teach, no matter which one you choose. They're introducing two letter phonograms here. Again, you're going into whistling whales, a sh day, so they give you examples for that. Then phonogram tic-tac-toe, this is something that's going to be in your workbook that you get to do with the kids. Spelling list, this is just retelling you how they go through spelling in case for some reason you don't remember from the previous book or maybe you're starting in this book so you haven't come across this yet. So it's just, it's going over the information again for you, um, but that's typically only in the first lesson. They, and they only give you extra help like this if they feel it's needed, otherwise they just give you this set of words and they sh assume you know how to go through it um, the way that they taught you. And you can use that quick reference guide again, um, reading practice down here. So again, it's very, very similar. Let me show you towards the end of the book now. Oh, I wanted to show you this. I found this. So here they have a book list again, and they're telling you which Bob books work perfectly with this lesson. So they will tell you exactly which one matches up. And then this is saying take out reader three. So those readers I just showed you. And then you go over it and they have questions you can ask your child to make sure they're comprehending what they're reading. It also goes over, tell me what the title of the story is and where we can find it. And, you know, what do we think this story is going to be about based on the title? So they do go over comprehension already in this reading assessment. Okay, here's the fun one. So you have reading that they do on a page, and then they have this thing called high frequency words. And this is something that I dropped the ball on. I'm just gonna be totally honest with you about that. And I do not want you to fall into the same trap that I did with it. Let me see if I can find a high frequency word page for you first in one of our books. I'm going to show you from book C what a high frequency word page is because we already ripped them all out of our B book, but I want you to see what it looks like. So. It is just a list of words on a piece of paper that you can tear out and it says on the back, so you don't get them, mis them mistaken with anything else, it says high frequency words. So when you tear them out and cut them apart, you'll know that they're a high frequency word. So you have these throughout your entire workbook. Um, and what they tell you to read each word. So. I saw that in one of these earlier lessons. Okay, read the words. Well, I just had them keep them in the workbook and read the words to me. Great, they read the words, we moved on, right? Well, it wasn't till many lessons later, closer to the end of the book, that I actually read more about what they actually wanted you to do with these. Oh, look at even over here. <laughs> high frequency words, practice ideas. You can play games with them, which is commonly what they want you to do. So you are actually going to gather high frequency words throughout this entire level, keep them together, and you need a set for each child. And this is how I kept them together eventually once I figured out my mistake. I have them in a Ziploc bag like this, okay? Then I have inside that Ziploc bag, a smaller Ziploc bag. This, these are the high frequency words that this child has mastered. So they have put, are being put set aside. The rest in this bag are ones that we still need to work on. 
So either games need to be played with this or they need to be just used as flashcards. So how I've started using them, because we got really behind on this because like I said, I totally dropped the ball and wasn't, I was just having them read them once and we were moving on. I wasn't like repeating having them read them and going over them over and over and over again until later. And I realized I really need <laughs> to get on this. So I would show them a flashcard and then I'd have three piles. If it, the, if they could not sound out this or could not read this word in a snap and they had to sound it out and it took them a while, I would flip it over and put it in the top pile. If they could sound it out fairly quickly, but it wasn't as quick as a snap, I put it in the middle pile. If they could sound it out like a snap, then it got put in the bottom pile. Anything that ended up in the bottom pile was going to get transferred to this bag because I knew they knew that word. Anything that ended up in the top pile had to be gone over again another day. So it automatically was just going to go the, behind this stack. These middle ones, I was going to give them another chance on. So once we got through as much as we were getting through, I would pick up this stack and we would go through it again right away. And then I would do the same store, sorting. Oftentimes these ones would end up down here, but sometimes they would actually end up here and also here. So if they ended up down here, great. They got them put away in this bag. If not, they would, these middle ones would get added to the top ones, which would get added to all these. We'd put them away for another day that we needed to practice them. So that's how I would go through and figure out which ones the kids knew and which ones they needed to work on. Now, if we had actually been working on these the entire time that we should have been with this program and kept up with it, this stack probably would not be as big as it is. Granted, this is also my youngest daughter's. I can show you, this is my oldest daughter's. So she has not nearly as much left. This is our last set from our B book that we need to incorporate into here. I just wanted to practice them a little bit more. That's why they're separated out. But she she has gotten through almost all of them. Um, so she just needs more work on these ones. Um, so I just, I know that if, hers would be smaller too, if we um, had kept up with it. It also includes, and I keep these in here because it has like silly ones because there's different games that you play with. You can play with these cards that they give you the instructions for in the book. Um, and so if you were to pull one of these cards, then you're supposed to do something with them. So these even aren't all uh, cards that she has to read. So her, her stack is even uh, smaller than this. But I keep them in here because I thought it would it's a good break when you're going through flashcard after flashcard after flashcard and then they come across a silly card. It makes them laugh and they think it's ridiculous. And so it kind of breaks up the, the monotony of having to go through flashcards. Plus they see this stack and it can be daunting, but then they know that there's going to be something fun in there too. So it's not, it doesn't seem as bad. It's kind of a mental thing. So I've kept those in there just for that. Even though we aren't playing the games, I just kept them in there. So like I said, I just keep all of these in their own Ziploc so that I have them ready to go. I use an old baby wipes container to put everything in. Um, so they're, they're good to go. The last thing I wanted to tell you. So those pages of those high frequency words that they get in their book and it's throughout the book and I need to do this. I just realized because we have them in here. So you could wait until it, you come across this page in your workbook, have the child rip it out, cut out all the pages, all the pieces. And that's great. It's good tactile, you know, good motor skills, all of that good stuff. But for me, wanting to get through the lesson that day, it held it up. Plus, I have three children at three different levels. So we would typically have people who were done way ahead of time or, you know, done really quickly, not ahead of time, and others that took longer. So the ones that were already de done were like waiting around and it kind of, again, interrupted the flow. So what I ended up doing with all the high frequency word pages uh, that I had left in the book, I went through and I tore them all out myself for each child. Then I took my handy dandy paper cutter and I cut them myself so that they were ready to go. And then I would put them with a paper clip like this. I would cut out this top part right here 
that showed what lesson it belongs with. So I would put that at the front so that I knew which one I needed to grab. And I just needed to grab three of them for my three kids and grab those out for the lesson we needed them for. So for me, that was a time saver and it just helped me out a lot not having to wait on my kids to do this. If you want to wait on your kids to do that, please do it. It just, it was not working for me and our, us and the time we had. So again, I just wanted to, I want to tell you what, how we use this and what we've done in case it helps you if this is something you're going to use. So this, that's, that's how I got on that tangent. I just saw this. Okay. So let's look back a little further. Oh, one thing I totally forgot to mention in level A and all the levels have this. After every, after five lessons, you always have a review. Always. It's, it's very systematic. They tell you what area you're working on, the skill that you should have in that area, and then they give you a code, a number code, as to whether or not that skill needs to be mastered before you move on in the book. If there is a one next to it, that means that that skill needs to be mastered before you go any further. So if your child does not, cannot do these things and your review lesson that you'll see, and I'll try to pull one up in the workbook. Um, let me do that right now. Your review lesson goes over everything. Everything that they want you to in here, it's in here. So it says, add an S to make a word plural. You're adding an S to make a word plural if it should be. So obviously that's not, not, not. So to be able to recognize that something should be plural and that needs to be mastered before you move on. Then you have handwriting practice. This is something that I read out loud and it's finding the right phonogram. If I say a phonogram sound, you need to be able to recognize how it's spelled. So it's, it's called what's that phonogram. And we always had fun with these for some reason. So again, it's saying you need to know these phonograms, these phonogram sounds. Now this one on this particular review, it has a two next to it, which means that your child needs to be really familiar with it, but it does not have to be mastered. If there was a three here, that means that concept was fairly recently introduced to your child. So don't worry if they even aren't even that familiar with it. We're going to cover it more later. So it's just something that, you know, we want to make sure that it's been introduced at least. But um, twos, if your child knows it somewhat, great. If they don't have it mastered, not a problem. But ones has to be mastered. So they go over all of that with you. And again, I think there's more to this review. They always typically have reading of some sort at the end and they vary it what exactly you're gonna what you're gonna do and then they also have high frequency words making sure that your child can read the high frequency words at the end of a review if you or i should say if your child does not have something mastered they always give you practice ideas in each of those topics so in handwriting if your child cannot do these these are some ideas or these are pages you can go back to to get more help with that particular skill. Again, with the phonograms, high frequency words and reading, they give you help at the end of every single review so that you're not, again, you're not left hanging. They help you a ton in this program. I was going to say, I think that's everything, but I didn't really show you the workbook. My daughter loves to draw. So can you tell? So they, oh, there's also, so here's a tic-tac-toe. They also do bingo in here at times, which is my kid's favorite thing because, and I'm just going to kind of flip through this so you guys can see it. Again, it's very similar to level A. Oh, looks like we didn't, <laughs> we didn't tear out these high frequency words. Well, look at that. Um, oh, here's, here's a word bingo. It's my kid's favorite because I let them play with chocolate chips. So they use chocolate chips as their markers and then they get to eat them when they're all done. So that is their favorite thing to do as far as this book goes because they love the chocolate chips. But again, again, my daughter loves to draw. And bingo isn't every single lesson. This is unusual that that one came up so quickly between the lessons. Again, what's that phonogram? So they're familiar with it before you even get to the review. 
there's things where they cut things out, a phonogram flip. So it's like, you see the phonogram. Oh, let me go up here. That's how it is in manuscript. Now you write it in cursive. So I'm not sure exactly how that would go in a manuscript book. Um, how that's different. But they have reading things. I just got interrupted, so I'm not sure where I was at. But I think I'm just showing you guys this. Again, more high frequency words that we we didn't use. Hmm. Oh, and these, and again, more cut out things. So, and then drawing pictures based on what's written in the book. So it's um very similar to level A. And I think that is it now for level B. And then in case you're wondering um, where I store everything that we use, um, so this is just a bookcase we have in our dining room where we school. And on this second shelf, I keep our current teacher's manual. And now you see there's a knitting mites for instead of the doodling dragons or whistling whales. These are the readers that go along with it. I have that quick reference spelling and phonogram and handwriting one. Um, so I have all those there. That's those game cards. This is where all those high frequency words are. And then up here on this shelf is where I keep that crate with all of the flashcards. So this is everything that we are currently using. And then on this second bookshelf that I have in another corner of the dining room, I have everything that we have already used and then what we have coming up and then there's some more readers in there that's from level B and then those are going to be for level D obviously color coded so that makes it easy to um, find them and then I also have those handwriting books down here so I keep all of these stored separately and then my kids have these little folders um, and in here is where they keep their workbook and their whiteboard in there. Can you see that? Whiteboard and workbook. And then we have a different drawer system here with uh, all of the rags for the dry erase board. And then over here, this is where we keep, they were supposed to be mommy's dry erase markers, but um, they've turned into everyone's dry erase markers. So that's where we store everything as well. Well, I hope that was a thorough enough um, look through and review of Logic of English, uh, the Foundation series books A and B. If you have any questions, um, please leave them in the comments below. I will do my best to answer them for you as a homeschooling mom who has done these two books to completion now. Um, I will do my best. Otherwise, I think they have a really good customer service um, line over at Logic of English, you could probably ask them anything. I, have, I haven't needed to do that yet, but then again, I also have my charter school that I can go to to um, ask them questions as well. Um, but from what I believe I remember hearing, they have a really good customer service department there. So if I can't ask, answer your question, hopefully they will be able to for you. Um, yeah, if you liked this type of video, this particular one or the, just this type of video, please give it a thumbs up. That way I know that this is the type of content you would like to see on my channel and I will do my best to make it um, a priority to get more videos like this out on my channel for you to see. And if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, uh, go ahead and click that red subscribe button down below and that way you won't miss out on future videos that I do. So thank you so much for watching. I hope it was informative and helpful to you in your homeschooling journey, and I will see you in my next video. Bye.